sponsored by Ting. iPad OS 14 has just gone into public beta. So if you're even thinking about giving it a test drive before it goes into general release this fall, then this video is for you. And I've also already done a complete iOS 14 preview and have Mac OS, Watch OS, and all the AirPods, HomePods, and Home stuff coming your way soon. So hit the subscribe button and bell right now and you won't miss any of that. You can get on any and all of Apple software testing programs via beta.apple.com. Just remember that beta really does mean beta. So don't put it on your primary iPad if that's something you need to rely on for your day-to-day -day life because there will be bugs, apps that don't work, and all sorts of other stuff along the way. And even if one beta works fine, doesn't mean the next beta will work at all. So always make sure you back up before you beta, just in case you decide you really, really want to go back. If you're running iPadOS 13 on your current iPad, you'll be able to run iPadOS 14 on that exact same iPad. And that includes every iPad from the 2014 iPad Air 2 to the 2015 iPad Mini 2 to 2017 iPad and just all of the iPads Pro. As always, Apple's commitment to software updates is really, truly just unmatched. Although I really wish every other vendor would start matching it. Now, it may seem like the iPad didn't get as much attention or as many big updates as the iPhone did this year, that Apple is continuing their more like every other year cadence for the iPad. And that's, that's kind of sort of true, but only kind of sort of. See, obviously the iPad didn't get the new home screen experience the iPhone did, which, well, more hot take on that in just a hot minute. And it also didn't get like anything in a way of a fix for the still fussy, fiddly, multi-window mechanics from last year. But the iPad is getting not just everything coming in iPad OS 14, but a lot of what's coming in iOS 14 as well. That includes all the new features in messages, Memoji, maps, privacy, accessibility, app clips, though obviously not with NFC options, and camera, photos, more. There's no Translate app, which is just like Kevin's Sorbo levels of disappointing, but you know, the iPad got a fairly monstrous update just last March, something the iPhone did not. An update featuring trackpad, mouse, and cursor support that if Apple had waited for WWDC to introduce, well, it would have made the 2020 iPad Pro release way less impactful, but hot damn if it wouldn't have spiced up iPad OS 14. And sure, that was then, this is now, and what have you done for my iPad lately? But Apple did use iPad OS 14 and WWDC to provide way more insight into how exactly this new cursor system works. Specifically, how the initial round cursor is meant to just better fit touchscreen devices in the traditional, more precise, but also far more finicky arrow pointer. How it doesn't just morph into button shapes to give you visual confirmation that you're hitting your target, but also magnetically snaps to them and between them to help you more confidently differentiate and actually hit that target. If it thinks you're trying to reach something that's just further away than a trackpad swipe would allow, it'll actually throw and snap the cursor to what it thinks is your most likely target. Also, instead of making you guess if your arrow pointer is at the bottom of the top line or top of the bottom line and only letting you know if you got it right or wrong when you start dragging your way through it, it'll remove the ambiguity before you even start by snapping between the lines. All this just to say, Cursor support on the iPad is now way, way smarter and more sophisticated than it might have looked at first or swiped at first. And while I'm sure some of that is to work around the lack of affordance in modern iOS and precision in touch-first computing, it's also kind of low-key brilliant. And I'd love to see some of those considerations, especially the line snapping, get taken just all the way back to the Mac iPadOS is getting the new widget design, the one derived from SwiftUI Apple Watch complications. They look great. The information density is terrific. They're super easy to take in, even at a glance, and you can stack and smart stack them so you can fit a bunch of them into the same size space, and the right one will usually just pop up for you at the right time. They don't have the in-widget interactivity of the previous versions, though, and you can see my iOS 14 preview for just all the details and diatribes on that. But the iPadOS implementation also has an extra strike in its widget box. Unlike on the iPhone, where you can just drag and drop these shiny new little toys pretty much anywhere you want on the home screen, on the iPad, they're still locked and key thrown away into the basically Schrodinger's sidebar of the Today View. Which means, yeah, you have to swipe them over from the home screen or notification center or pin them on the home screen, but only in landscape mode. And it's just, it's a whole thing or mostly an unwhole thing. There's also no app library, which is the new end of the home screen screen on the iPhone, the one that automatically Maria condos all your apps into intelligent folders for you. And it's delightful and 
totally missing on the iPad. Now, it's been mentioned several times that the iPad screen is big enough and the icon grid can be made dense enough that you don't really need arbitrary widget placement or the app library. And hey, we're the nerds that kept asking for the iPad to get its own OS and be treated differently anyway. Whoops. But my guess is that the iPad is different enough now that things like how the small, medium, and large widgets would fit on a wider grid, handle both the more dense and bigger icon versions of that grid, and how they'd react to the grid reorganizing on rotation, things that just don't exist on the iPhone that Apple hasn't had time to implement them on the iPad yet. You know, hard deadlines and work from home being hard deadlines and work from home and all. But hopefully after piloting it all on the iPhone this year and seeing all the demand for it, we'll get it on the iPad next year. And if that's what you want, drop a like below so that demand can really be seen. Like the iPhone, the iPad is shedding its full screen takeovers, the ones for the phone and FaceTime calls, Siri and search for what Apple calls new compact interfaces. So now instead of a call just screen spreading across your display, you'll get banner notifications or in Siri's case, a swirling, pulsating powerball at relative bottom right, as opposed to absolute bottom center. Where the iPad scores a decisive presentational victory though, is search, new universal search. Swipe down on the screen or hit command space on the physical keyboard. And now you have the glory that has basically been Mac OS, don't call it spotlight search anymore for years. Results start to appear from the first character you type. You can launch apps from the moment they pop up. You can do knowledge-based searches, which is basically type to Siri that I've wanted for years. And you can search not just the web, but inside apps as well, which is terrific. It's only Apple apps for now, of course, but come general release this fall, hopefully a ton more text and data centric apps will just open wide to this new feature as well. And I kind of love this because there have been so many years where new iPad ideas and conventions have been taken back to the Mac. So it's great to see the iPad pulling more of these new and better Mac ideas and concepts just over to the iPad as well. And that includes things like sidebars, which are amongst just the Maciest of Mac interface conventions ever. You can find them freshly minted in mail, in notes, files, calendar, photos, and in a bunch of other built-in apps. And come this fall, hopefully a lot of developer apps as well. Like so many of the other more complicated, more traditional computer paradigms Apple's been adding to iOS over the years, they're also not just all up jammed in your face by default. You have to tap in one of the new crisp clean toolbar buttons to reveal them, which I think is great. It shows that even as Apple is increasingly evolving the iPhone and iPad to better fit the needs of the tiny but incredibly vocal, legit adorable minority of us nerds, they're not abandoning the vast majority of mainstream users. The ones that find traditional computer complexity, not just off-putting, but alienating. You know, the ones the iPad was actually literally designed for to begin with. Anyway, sidebars. Yes, for those of us nerds used to the Mac, they are great. Along with the new pull down menus, not only do they provide for far better consistency between the iPad and the newly redesigned Mac OS platforms, come later this year when Apple Silicon Macs start to ship and they can run iPad apps natively right alongside Mac apps, it'll provide for far better consistency on that platform specifically as well. Don't you just love it when a serendipitous plan comes together? I went over a bunch of the built-in app updates in my iOS 14 preview. Things like app mentions and reply threads and messages, and cycling directions and skyline scanning and maps. Link to all that in the description. But there's also a lot more in this update. Notes has a new dropdown that tries to make the most relevant actions pretty much instantly available to you in any given note. The pinned note section is now collapsible too. So if you, like me, have just a ton of stuff pinned, you can tap it away now so you can get to everything else without having to grunt scroll all the way past the pins every single time you wanna to get to everything else. Document scanning is sharper and with better cropping and search is smarter with top hits and what Apple calls elevated results for attachments, including images, PDFs, and web pages. But there's still no plain text mode, at least that I can find, which is the one thing that keeps all of this from being just perfect for me. You can now assign reminders to anyone you share a list with, which is both great and how dare you? I mean, we'll see how many relationships can withstand. You were clearly the DRI on canceling Quibi. What happened? There's also a new details menu so you can more easily and quickly send out assignments as well and also add things like flags, dates, times, and locations. Reminders will also offer you smart suggestions for those locations and dates and lists you may wanna move tasks to as well as pulling potential reminders for you right out of your email. 
I'm always kind of wary of to-do feature creep because I never want my task manager to become just one more task to manage. But so far, Apple is maintaining a pretty good balance. And they're also adding some fun and whimsy. There are almost a dozen new symbols and full emoji support so you can really personalize your reminders and take your reminder assignment game to the next level. Emoji impatient Judge Judy just tapping furiously away on watch. Yeah, there's no iPad version of the Translate app, which is depressing given how much emphasis Apple places on the universality of all their apps, except for, you know, calculator and weather. And I still love to know who's holding the compromat over that PM for those emissions. But Safari will now translate web pages directly, which is great for anyone who doesn't want to just shovel yet more free behavioral data at Google. It currently supports English, Spanish, simplified Chinese, French, German, Russian, and Brazilian Portuguese. Safari will now show you more and better tabs with fave icons on by default. So you can more easily find the ones you're looking for at a glance. And using cryptographic derivation, which I think basically means getting something usable from a secret while still maintaining that secret, Safari will also check to see if any accounts you're storing in Apple's keychain system may have been hacked or otherwise compromised. And if so, prompt you to change your password or switch to sign in with Apple if it's available. You can also tap the options button and then privacy report to see everything, all the cross-site trackers on all the web pages you've been going to have been up to. And it's a lot. So yeah, we totally did find out if anyone can hear data harvesters scream in their hearts. Game Center is getting the biggest update since Apple shaved off all of its green felt and pretty much everything else along with it a few years ago. There is a new in-game dashboard that gives you all your and all of your friends' progress in one easy to see, easy to gloat over place. And you can tap into it to get your profile, your achievements, the leaderboard, even get more friend recommendations. Game Center is also integrated right into the App Store now, both into the games and arcade tabs and into the individual game app pages as well. That means you can see which games your friends are playing before you even download them, so you can easily join them or totally dodge them, like Allie. You can tell just how seriously Apple takes ARKit by how relentlessly they've been improving it year after year, and ARKit 4.0 may just be the biggest, most audacious update yet. RealityKit is getting video textures, so yeah, you can map a virtual movie screen to your real life wall or facial expressions to a head model, ripples to a river, pretty much anything you want to animate. If you have the latest iPad Pro with LiDAR, the new Depthy API will let virtual objects behave far more naturally in the real world. That includes things like virtual clothing try-ons, video and photo editing and effects. And then there are just mind-blowing things like location anchors that let you drop AR experiences not just into the real world, but into precise real-world places in the real world. Basically, you pick a famous area or a landmark or just your house, and then Apple pulls all the rich, detailed data from the new maps they've just launched in the US and are continuing to roll out in Canada, Ireland, and the UK, and the AR experience can just lock right into it. Sort of like, I don't know, the opposite of the matrix. And then you can move around the virtual objects and see them in a way that's just far, far closer to how real world objects would look in the same situation. And I just, I cannot wait to put Gundam or the SDF-1 or a Valkyrie right in my driveway, and even more when I no longer have to hold up an iPhone or an iPad to see it. As big as the trackpad and cursor update was last March, as much as it helped make the iPad work more like a traditional computer for everyone who still wants to use the iPad as a traditional computer, I am just exponentially more excited about the pencil updates coming this fall. So for example, now, if you draw a shape and you pause at the end and keep the pencil down, iPadOS will just convert it into the perfect, geometric, platonic ideal of that shape. And that works for straight lines with and without arrows, curves with and without arrows, outline arrow shapes, continuous lines with 90 degree angles, squares, rectangles, circles, ovals, hearts, triangles, stars, clouds, thought bubbles, hexagon. For handwriting, it's just a quantum leap forward, like from Sam to Archer to pride-sized leaps. First and most importantly, the iPad will just treat handwriting like typed writing now. And what I mean by that is it'll use machine learned models that Apple's been building and training for years to just identify writing, you know, as opposed to abstract doodling, down to the individual strings and the characters that compose them. It doesn't learn or get better at understanding your personal handwriting. It's just been trained on an incredibly wide range of handwriting samples. For things humans don't typically write, but may write on an iPad, things like URLs, Apple even created machine learning models to produce writing samples for the other machine learning models to learn from. 
It's just machine learning all the way down in the most brilliant, terrifying way imaginable. And because the iPad can identify your handwriting now, you can select it in the same way you've been able to select typed text in basically forever. Just double tap and then you can move or change the color, even copy and paste as handwriting or as typed text. And if what you write triggers a data detector, like a phone number, email address, physical address, or web address, it'll even be turned into a link. So you can tap on it and go straight to FaceTime, Maps, Mail, or Safari, and then there's Scribble. See, instead of just understanding handwriting as if it was typed text, Scribble actually turns your handwriting into typed text. It's designed for text fields that expect you to type. As long as you start in the field, it doesn't matter if you wander off, your text will just go right into that field. In addition to generating typed text, you can also use Scribble to edit. You can circle a word to select it. And if the word offends you, you can take up your pencil and scratch it out to delete it and end it. It can basically do just about everything for you, except save you money on your phone bill. For that, you need Ting especially if you, like me, are working from home right now, which is tons of Wi-Fi and no need to pay for any more data than you actually use. Same with talk, same with text. Ting offers coverage on Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint. So no matter where you are or where you go, you'll have more service options in more places. And it works with almost any phone. The iPhone, sure, absolutely. But the Google Pixel, the Samsung Galaxy, pretty much anything. And it's super easy to get started. Just go to renee.ting.com, create an account. They send you a SIM card. You put it in your phone and you're good to go. And if you have any issues, they have award-winning customer support, not just ready, but happy to help you out. The average Ting bill is just $23 a month with no contracts, no commitments. And since you're watching this video, you can get a $25 service credit to try them out. Bring your own phone. You can even bring your own number if you want to. Just go to renee.ting.com and click the link in the description. See how much you can save and get $25 off. Thanks, Ting, and thanks to all of you for your support. For more previews, check out the playlist above. See you next video.